guys, so now that I'm back from Venice and we've had all the buzz out of Cam, Tiff and Telluride, it's time for me to give you a ridiculously early Oscar prediction video. You guys have been asking for it, so I thought to give the people what they want. At this point, it really is just conjecture, a guessing game, because we don't have a lot of information yet. Just reactions from film festivals. We don't have any precursor nominations. We also haven't seen everything yet. Like a bunch of movies that seem like Oscar contenders, nobody's seen them and yet they're showing up in people's predictions. But even though it is ridiculously early, it's still fun to theorize who might be nominated. And my predictions you see in this video now are probably gonna look very different in six months time. But before we go any further, if you guys like Oscars season content, be sure to click subscribe, help support my channel by hitting that thumbs up button or by leaving me a comment in the comment section down below with your early Oscar predictions. And also I just wanna give a quick shout out to some other Oscars related YouTube channels that you should be following. Please do subscribe to Max Joseph Film Person, The Oscar Expert, The Film Drunk, and Austin Burke. They all do awesome award season coverage. So yeah, if you like award season stuff, follow their channels. Right, so I'm gonna go through each of the categories, minus the shorts, those will come later in award season. And I'm gonna give you my predictions for each category. It's gonna look a little something like this. Name of the category at the top, and the five in white, or in the case of Best Picture, the 10 in white. Those are my current predictions as to who I think is going to be nominated in this category. And the one that's in bold at the top, that is the one that I think is going to win. I'm gonna give you some analysis and justification as to why those are the ones that I've selected. And then all the ones at the bottom, those are ones that are alternates. They might come later during the race, they might climb up, some might fall down. Always happens during awards season, so. Yeah, all clear, makes sense. Shall we do this? Sounds like a plan. All right, so gonna kick things off with one of my favorite categories of any year, which is Best Actress. And already, this is shaping up to be one of the most stacked categories of this year. My current prediction is Kristen Stewart for performance as Diana Spencer in the movie Spencer. The reasons for this is because it's the right role for the right actress at the right time in her career. It ticks a lot of the boxes that Academy usually goes for with the Best Actress nomination. Playing a real life notable historical figure with a good dollop of tragedy. She lost a lot of weight to play the role. She absolutely dominates the screen time in the film. Really, Kristen Stewart is this movie. She, it's a star vehicle performance for her and she's currently my number one. I'm also gonna say it now, I think she's one of the few people that I would consider to be a lock for this category. But she does have some tight competition from Jessica Chastain in the eyes of Tammy Faye. Again, it's just another box checker performance that the Academy loves. She's playing a real life person. She transformed into the role. There was a lot of makeup involved in that transformation. It's a showcase performance where Jessica Chastain gets to sing, cry, scream. She's also front and center for the majority of the film's runtime. She also won the Tribute Actor Award at TIFF. And also Jessica Chastain has a good narrative. She's been twice nominated before for the Hell and for Zero Dark Thirty. She kind of has an overdue narrative working in her favor. I would say that Jessica Justine is pretty much a lock for this category too, but the only reason I'm not confirming that at this moment is because I haven't seen The Eyes of Tammy Faye, so I, I can't say that with certainty just yet. We've also got Nicole Kidman playing Lucille Ball in Being the Ricardos. That could be a total Oscar baity role for Nicole Kidman. Again, I've not seen the film yet, but I don't think anyone has, so that's why she's not currently in my predicted five. I currently do have Jennifer Hudson for Respect. A biopic about Aretha Franklin has Oscar bait written all over it, and even though the movie wasn't Warmly received, Jennifer Hudson got universal praise, so I can see her showing up here, but I'm just not certain of it just yet, still really early. No one has seen House of Gucci yet, and yet everyone thinks that Lady Gaga is gonna get a nomination for this film. I know there's a very vocal, diehard group of little monsters out there wanting to see Lady Gaga nominated for this performance, but can we see the film first before we start pushing that campaign? <laughs> Olivia Coleman for The Lost Daughter. It's her most challenging role to date. She would totally be worthy of a nomination. Penelope Cruz won the Volpe Cup at Venice for Best Actress, but now that Spain has just announced that their submission for Best International Feature this year is going to be The Good Boss instead of Parallel Mothers, makes me think that Penelope Cruz's chances are slimmer than what they were. Some people have an asterisk next to their name. That's because we're not 100% sure yet if the person in question is going to submit themselves for leading performance or supporting. So, Catriona Bell for Belfast, she could be leading, but I think she'll have a better chance in, of winning in supporting. And the same goes with Frances McDormand, even though she is, you know, starring alongside 
Denzel Washington in The Tragedy of Macbeth. She is kind of a supporting character, but at the same time a lead. Jodie Comer as well. Technically, I think she's a lead in The Last Duel, but could easily move over to supporting and have a better chance there. She's the best thing about The Last Duel. And also, Jodie Comer is such a hot property right now. She's been having a phenomenal few years with Killing Eve, Free Guy, and now The Last Duel. I can see the Academy rallying behind an up and coming British actress who's very much of the moment. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if she did make it in there, but currently I don't have her in my five. And the other performances which are on the peripheries of being nominated are Jennifer Lawrence for Don't Look Up, Tessa Thompson for Passing, Taylor Page for Zola, Amelia Jones for Coda, Rachel Zegler for West Side Story, Hayley Bennett for Roxanne, and Renate Rinsby for Worst Person in the World, and she also won the Best Actress um, Award at Cannes. Is there anybody I missed? Please do let me know in the comment section down below and let me know your predictions for Best Actress as well. All right, so next up we have Best Actor, and the race for Best Actor doesn't really feel like it's taken shape just yet. I'm only confident with a couple of these picks. Currently my predicted winner is Will Smith for King Richard, and I do like the sound of that. Academy Award winner Will Smith just sounds right, doesn't it? Will Smith has received nothing but overwhelming praise for his portrayal of Richard Williams, who was the father of tennis players Serena and Venus Williams. At the moment he seems like the early frontrunner, but nothing is set in stone. After his win for tribute actor at TIFF, Benedict Cumberbatch seems like a likely contender for his performance as Machismo Ranchman Phil Burbank in Jane Campion's The Power of the Dog. This will be Cumberbatch's second nomination. His previous was for The Imitation Game back in 2015. I feel quite confident about Will Smith and Benedict Cumberbatch, but the other three slots in the category, they're more up in the air. Peter Dinklage made a lot of noise for his performance in the musical Sirono. I hope I'm saying that right. Peter Dinklage has been earning a lot of respect in the industry this past decade, and it would be nice to see him get his first ever Oscar nomination. We also have some other musical contenders like Anthony Ramos in In the Heights, perhaps Andrew Garfield for Tick Tick Boom. Andrew Garfield could actually be looking at two nominations this year, one for leading in Tick Tick Boom and another for supporting in The, the Eyes of Tammy Faye. Denzel Washington is an Academy favorite and he's been earning rave reviews for his performance in The Tragedy of Macbeth. I can see him being nominated here and if he does get a nomination, he'll be one of six actors in history to earn nine nominations for acting at the Academy Awards, and also be the first black man to ever accomplish that. We could also have some last minute contenders from some other Academy favorites like Bradley Cooper in Nightmare Alley, Adam Driver in House of Gucci, Joaquin Phoenix in Come On, Come On, Leonardo DiCaprio in Don't Look Up, or Javier Bardem in Being the Ricardos. But if the Academy is looking to honor some great performances in smaller, more unconventional films, then we could see a nomination for Simon Rex in Red Rocket, Nicolas Cage in Pig, Clifton Collins in Jockey, or Caleb Landry Jones in The Trim. Nothing is out of the question yet. Okay, so next up we have Best Supporting Actress, and like Supporting Actress last year, this seems way too early to call. I don't think there's a frontrunner yet, although Kirsten Dunst certainly does have her supporters for The Power of the Dog. I have put Kirsten Dunst in my top five for now, but I don't think she's a lock. I think we've got a lot more to see from this category. Katriana Balf is my current predicted winner for this category. Based on the reactions from the people who've seen this film, she seems like a credible front runner. So I'm going to put her as my predicted pick for now, but that can all change. We had some meaty work from Jesse Buckley and Dakota Johnson in The Lost Daughter. I think Jesse Buckley's more likely than Johnson, but they also do run the risk of canceling each other out. Often industry veterans will make an appearance in this category. Recently we've had Kathy Bates in Richard Jewell, as well as last year we had Glenn Close for Hillbilly Elegy and Ya Jung Yoon who won for Minari. So there's a credible chance that someone like Olga Meredith could make it in for In the Heights or even Judy Dench for Belfast. However, Dench might be at a disadvantage if her co-star Katriana Balf also goes for supporting. So who else do we have? We've got Anne Dowd and Martha Plinton both from Mass. I think Anne Dowd will make it in. I'm not so sure about Martha Plinton, but again, they could both not show up here, just cancel each other out. Rebecca Ferguson for Dune, Marley Matlin for Coda, Hayley Bennett for Cyrano, Gabby Hoffman for Come On, Come On, Ingenue Ellis for King Richard, Brie Elrod for Red Rocket, Amy Adams for Dear Evan Hansen, Sally Hawkins for Spencer. There's also some films that we've yet to see which could potentially upset the race further down the line, like Tony Collette in Nightmare Alley, 
Regina King in The Harder They Fall, Kate Blanchett for Don't Look Up, or Meryl Streep also for Don't Look Up. The Academy loves them some Streep. And also Ariana DeBose for West Side Story. Certainly gonna be an interesting race. What do you guys think of this category? Best Supporting Actor. So the one that immediately comes to mind for me is Timothy Spall in Spencer. A lot of people don't see eye to eye with me with this prediction, and there is a chance I will change it over the coming months, but I was really impressed by Timothy Spall in Spencer, even though it is the Kristen Stewart show. Timothy Spall definitely makes an impact. And he's also an actor who's never been nominated for an Oscar before, despite a rich body of work. And I think he could show up here. So I've got him in my five for now, that might change. Also like Best Supporting Actress, I don't think we have a clear front runner yet for Best Supporting Actor. I mean, look at last year's Oscars and how late Daniel Kaluuya came into the race with Judas and the Black Messiah. Kieran Hines, who you guys might remember as Mance Raider from Game of Thrones, he got a lot of praise for his performance in Belfast, so he could show up here. Right Rising star Corey Hawkins has had a great year, what with In the Heights, and he could be nominated for his supporting performance as Macduff in The Tragedy of Macbeth. Troy Kotzer could find himself a spot for his deeply moving performance in Coda. I personally really want to see that happen. I also imagine that Cody Smith McPhee and Jesse Plemons will both be submitting themselves for supporting actor for The Power of the Dog, but again, two roles in the same movie, they could cancel each other out. A nomination for Woody Norman in Come On Come On would make him the youngest nominee at age 11, but I'm having difficulty thinking Woody Norman will make the cut. We've also got a lot of people contending for the first ever Oscar nomination in this category, like Jeffrey Wright in The French Dispatch, Coleman Domingo in Zola, Bradley Whitford in Tick Tick Boom, Ben Affleck in The Tender Bar, Eugenio Debez in Coda, Jason Isaacs in Mass, who I've got as my predicted winner at the moment, but that's probably gonna change. Uh, Idris Elba for The Heart of the Day 4, and John Bernthal for King Richard. Like I said before, Andrew Garfield could show up in this category now that Variety have confirmed that he is being submitted for supporting actor for The Eyes of Tammy Faye. What do you guys think? Do you think he will get the double nomination next year? And also we've got um, J.K. Simmons for Being the Carters, hasn't been nominated since he won for Whiplash back in 2015. Richard Jenkins could show up here for either Nightmare Alley or The Humans. Benicio Del Toro for The French Dispatch. Bradley Cooper for Licorice Pizza, and also Jonah Hill for Don't Look Up, Javier Bardem for Being the Ricardos, and Jared Leto for House of Gucci. So yeah, this is a category where I think the race is wide open. Okay, so next up we have Best Original Screenplay, and it seems very likely that Kenneth Branagh is gonna be getting a nomination for Belfast. I currently have him as my predicted winner in this category. However, that could change once I've seen Paul Thomas Anderson's Licorice Pizza. It's crazy to think that Paul Thomas Anderson has never won an Oscar. Could Licorice Pizza be the film that finally gets him his first Oscar? Also, when it comes to best original screenplay and adapted screenplay, usually there is quite a lot of overlap with the screenplays and the best picture nominees. So it's kind of a smart move to go for films that you think are going to be nominated for best picture when you're doing the screenplay predictions. By that logic, I think Stephen Knight has a good chance with Spencer. Even though I haven't seen it yet, Aaron Sorkin's Being the Ricardos, I think has a good chance of making it in here just because it's Aaron Sorkin. He's one of the most prolific screenwriters of our time, and he's just a safe, sensible bet when it comes to original screenplays. Pedro Almodovar hasn't had a nomination for writing since he won for Talk to Her back in 2002. Parallel Mothers is one of his more accessible films. Could it be enough to land him a Best Original Screenplay nomination? It's certainly possible, but I don't think it's a guarantee. Same can be said about Mike Mills and Come On, Come On. His previous nomination was for 20th Century Women back in 2016. Adam McKay's scripts usually do click with the Academy. He previously won for The Big Short back in 2016 and was also nominated for Vice. Just from what I've seen of the trailer, I'm not sure about his chances for Don't Look Up, but nobody's seen it yet, so it might actually be brilliant. And then others who might make the cut include Wes Anderson for The French Dispatch, Paolo Sorrentino for The Hand of God, Asghar Faraday for A Hero, Sean Baker for Red Rocket, Mia Hansen-Love for Bergman Island, and Zach Balin for King Richard. Next up we have Best Adapted Screenplay, and this might actually be a tougher one to call than Best Original Screenplay. There's been so many awesome adaptations this year. The first one which springs to my mind is Dune. Denis Villeneuve managed to bring what many considered to be an unadaptable novel to life. Villeneuve, John Spathes, and Eric Roth all deserve a nomination for making the impossible possible. It's way too 
early to call, and also sci-fi has a terrible track record of winning screenplays at the Oscars. The nomination might be enough of a win for Dune, but I would say it's totally deserving. So far, it's my personal favorite to win. Other very likely contenders include Jane Campion for The Power of the Dog, Maggie Gyllenhaal actually won Best Script at the Venice Film Festival for her feature debut, The Lost Daughter. Can she ride that momentum all the way to an Oscar nomination? The film tackles some very heavy themes and I think she deserves acknowledgement. I know nobody's seen it yet, but I just can't not see Guillermo del Toro getting a nomination for Nightmare Alley. Unless the movie is like really terrible, that I just can't see that happening. So who else could get in? There has been a lot of love for Sean Heater's Coda, and I think they are gonna wanna honor it somewhere, and the screenplay might be the best place for this. But as we've seen in the past, hits that have come from Sundance haven't always made it to the Oscars. Look at Lulu Wang's The Farewell. That should have been nominated, but sadly was snubbed. Joel Cohen has tackled Shakespeare in the tragedy of Macbeth, but how do you adapt Shakespeare and make it your own? The Academy hasn't really favored Shakespeare adaptations for screenplay nominations in the past. The only time it's happened was actually for Kenneth Branagh when he adapted Hamlet. That was back in 1997. But I wouldn't put it past Joel Cohen to get a nomination for a Shakespeare adaptation. Other potential nominations could come for Rebecca Hall with Passing, Juho Kuso Manon for Compartment Number 6, Stephen Levinson for Tick Tick Boom, Joe Wright for Cyrano, Abe Sylvia for The Eyes of Tammy Faye, Becky Johnston and Roberto Bentivegna for House of Gucci and Paul Verhoeven for Benedetta. Best costume design. Now already, this is going to be a phenomenal year for costume design. We still have six months until the Oscars, but I've already seen five films that are worthy of being nominated for costumes. But any film that has a fashion dynasty in the title of the film already has an incredible advantage. So even though nobody's seen the film yet, Janty Yates seems very likely to be a contender for House of Gucci. The trailer alone for that film put its fashion front and center. Another film that's yet to be released but got us very excited about the costumes from just the stills and the early trailer footage was Louis Sequeira for Nightmare Alley. Other possible contenders, Kirsty Cameron for The Power of the Dog, Marzi Rogers for Passing, Mitchell Travis for The Eyes of Tammy Faye, Odile Dix Moreau for Last Night in Soho, Milena Cannonero for The French Dispatch, Janty Yates again for The Last Duel, Mary Zopres for The Tragedy of Macbeth, Kim Barrett for Shang-Chi, Charlotte Walter for Belfast, and Mark Bridges for Licorice Pizza. Best production design. Now, already I see Tamara Deverell out in front for her work on Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley, which is a bold statement because no one's seen the film yet. The reliable thing about Guillermo del Toro movies is that he always succeeds in transporting his audience to another world, place, or building. His sets never feel like you're on a soundstage or in front of a green screen. It always feels like you're living in the world of that film, like sh The Shape of Water, Pan's Labyrinth, and just from the trailer footage for Nightmare Alley, we can tell we're gonna get the same experience. My eyes were drawn to the sets in the stills and trailer. Patrice Vermet also seems like a likely contender. His production design on Dune was exquisite. Those two I see as locks, quite frankly. The other three could go to a number of contenders. Guy Hendricks Dias for Spencer, Grant Major for The Power of the Dog, Jim Clay for Belfast, Belfast, Belfast. Florencia Martin for Licorice Pizza, Sarah Greenwood for Cyrano, Adam Stockhausen for The French Dispatch or West Side Story, and also Stefan Deschamps for The Tragedy of Macbeth. Possibly Victoria Allwood could get a nomination for Last Night in Soho. Previous winners in this category like Mank and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. The Academy's always liked seeing somewhere real transported back to a particular time period and what they do with real Soho in this film, transporting it back to the 1960s is jaw dropping. So maybe all would be get a nomination here, but for now, she's not in my top five. Cinematography, Bruno Del Bonnell seems to be the obvious front runner for cinematography this year. I mean, look at it. It's so striking. It's so pleasing to the eye and so different to everything else that we've seen this year. Plus the Academy loves a black and white film when it's done well. Past winners of cinematography include Mank and Roma, but there's no denying that 
Delba now has found something new with the black and white technique. It's just impossible to ignore, so it's currently my predicted winner for this category. But it's not the only black and white film that the Academy will get to choose from this year. I can also see support for Hans Zamba Lucas's work on Belfast. Granted, it's not as avant-garde as Del Bunnell's Black and White, but it's still gorgeous nonetheless. Robbie Ryan could show up for Come On, Come On, another black and white film, but out of all the black and white entries this year, this one seems the most likely to be excluded. When it comes to size, scale, and ambition, there is no denying the majesty of Greg Fraser's cinematography in Dune. It's the most show-stopping cinematography of the entire year. Nearly every single shot in that film is jaw-droppingly orgasmic. I feel quite confident about The Tragedy of Macbeth, Dune, and Belfast all getting nominations for cinematography. The other two slots are still up for grabs. I really love Claire Meathon's crisp and ethereal dreamlike cinematography that she did for Spencer. Ari Wagner did a great collaborative job with Jane Campion on The Power of the Dog, creating this very taut atmosphere. And also speaking of atmosphere, Dan Lavston should definitely be in the running for Nightmare Alley. Michael Bauman could surprise with his first ever feature for his collaboration with Paul Thomas Anderson on Licorice Pizza. Other possibilities could include Robert Yeoman for The French Dispatch, Janos Kaninsky for West Side Story, Darius Wolski for House of Gucci, Jeff Cronenworth for Being the Ricardos, Linus Sandgreen for Don't Look Up, or No Time to Die. Have you seen No Time to Die? That movie looks gorgeous. Uh, Alice Brooks for Tick Tick Boom, or Jose Luis Alque for Parallel Mothers, or Ruben Impens for Titan. I would love to see both No Time to Die and Titan get nominations for cinematography, but that might just be wishful thinking. Okay, so next up we have Best Editing. Now, this is always a bit of an interesting category. And with the Academy, the more editing you have, the more likely you are to get nominated by the Academy, because they love a bit of flash, a bit of style, something where you're very aware you're watching editing in action, whereas the more subtle, nuanced editing often gets overlooked by the Academy. I wish that wasn't the case, but more often than not, the flashiest film does win. So Hank Corwin's zany approach in Don't Look Up makes him someone to keep an eye on. But my current predicted pick is actually Joe Walker for Dune. This is gonna be a common thing you're gonna see. I freaking love Dune. I want it to win all the Oscars. Man, how Joe Walker manages to make this huge, epic story feels so intimate and personal at the same time is just astonishing. I can also see musicals resonating with the Academy this year. The Academy loves a well-polished, well-edited, sweeping musical number. It's the only reason why Bohemian Rhapsody won because of its Live Aid sequence. And yes, I am still bitter about that. So Myron Kirstein and Andrew Weisblum for Tick Tick Boom or Sarah Brosher and Michael Kahn for West Side Story could show up here. I can even make an argument for the effective sequences Gerard Brisson delivered in Coda. But another obvious one would be Unani Dongali for Belfast. Belfast is one of those films I can see being heavily nominated in all the technical categories. It's this year's Mank or La La Land. Other potential nominees, Spencer, The Power of the Dog, Being the Ricardos, Nightmare Alley, Parallel Mothers, The Tragedy of Macbeth, Licorice Pizza, or Siren Out. Next up we have Best Makeup and Hair Styling. Now, keeping with the recent trend of unrecognizable actors and prosthetics, there's two films which come to mind, which are The Eyes of Tammy Faye and House of Gucci. Both these films feature actors buried in prosthetics. These are two movies where the makeup and hairstyles are transformational. I mean, I didn't even know that was Jared Leto and all that stuff, so yes, I can see House of Gucci and The Eyes of Tammy Faye both being nominated here. Donald Mowalt for Dune seems very likely. Jacinda Biquette and Carla Farmer for King Richard. As for others, there's loads that could feature here. Cruella, Respect, Spencer, Naima Alley, The Tragedy of Macbeth, Last Night in Soho, The French Dispatch, West Side Story, Eternals, Licorice Pizza, Being the Ricardos, it's still anybody's guess at this point. Okay, so next up we have visual effects, and as far as I'm concerned, the winner has already been picked, and that is Dune. I'm sorry, everybody else can just go home. <laughs> no question, it's the front runner. Dune is going to win this. Everybody else is just playing for the remaining nomination slots. But who will get those slots? There's plenty of contenders. The Matrix Resurrections, Shang-Chi, Eternals, Don't Look Up, Godzilla vs. Kong, Spider-Man No Way Home, The Tomorrow War, A Quiet Place Part 2, The Suicide Squad, Black Widow, Ghostbusters Afterlife, Last Night in Soho, Finch, or Swan Song. Take your pick, guys, because it's gonna be Dune. It's one of the few categories which I feel this confident early on is going to be the winner. Not just a lock, 
but a winner. Next category is sound, and again, it's Dude. I'm not even sorry, it's the obvious choice. But also, musicals do tend to feature in the sound, well, it used to be categories, now it's just the one. So I could see West Side Story showing up here, In the Heights, Tick Tick Boom, Sirono. I'd love to see A Quiet Place Part 2 get a nomination for sound, because it did get a sound editing nom for the first film. It really is a film where you are aware of the sound because of the lack of it. Belfast, again, seems like a strong possibility. But other contenders, The Power of the Dog, just the sound of that comb bristle thing. Oh my god, that sent shivers down my spine. The Last Jewel, Swan Song, Don't Look Up, The Matrix Resurrections, King Richard, Eternals, Shang-Chi, The Harder They Fall, Nightmare Alley, and Spider-Man Far From Home. Next up we have Best Original Score. Now, arguably this is the year of Johnny Greenwood. However, at the moment I'm still going with Hans Zimmer for his spine-tingling, goose-pimpling score for Dune. As you can tell, I've got a real hard on for Dune. In the 10s, Hans Zimmer changed the game for movie scores with Inception. His thing was the bombs forever and everyone copied him. He pretty much revolutionized movie scores for the past decade, but with what he's done with Dune, he has completely reinvented himself and done something so bold, audacious, and refreshingly different to anything that he's done before. This is so new and exciting, and I'm gonna say it again, he makes bagpipes sound freaking amazing in this. He made me like bagpipes, okay? Give him the Oscar. I currently think he's the, the front runner, but I can also see Johnny Greenwood winning this because he has had a phenomenal year and could be looking at three potential nominations in this category. The one that he's most likely to win for, I would say, is for his jazz-infused score he did for Spencer. Oh my god, that film is so achingly beautiful, thanks in large part to Johnny Greenwood's score. But also he created a very heightened, suspenseful atmosphere in The Power of the Dog. And I've also he also produced the score for Licorice Pizza, but I haven't seen that yet or listened to the score. So he's not in their top five just yet, and I won't put him there until I've heard it and you know, made my own opinion on the matter, but uh, yes, he could potentially be the first, I want to say the first composer to be nominated three times in the same year. It's happened before the composers getting two nominations in the same year. Like Alessandro Desplat managed to do it in 2015 with the Imitation Game in the Grand Budapest Hotel, and he actually won for the Grand Budapest Hotel. So yeah, could... Johnny Green would be the first ever composer to have three nominations for Best Original Score in the same year. Could be done! Can he go for the hat trick? I would love to see it happen. As for other nominees, quite frankly, Nicholas Bratel was robbed of the win for If Beale Street Could Talk a few years back, and with the success he's had lately with Succession, and I haven't heard Don't Look Up, but I could see him definitely getting nominated for uh, don't look up. <laughs> Let's see, who else do we have? Oh, well, speaking of just black, The French Dispatch, James Samuel for The Harder They Fall, who also directed the movie, that's kind of amazing. And then there's Carter Burnwell for The Tragedy of Macbeth, Alberto Iglesias for Parallel Mothers, Harry Gregson Williams for House of Gucci, Theodore Shapiro for The Eyes of Tammy Faye, and Chris Bowers for King Richard. Okay, so next we have Best Original Song. Now, after a severely disappointing selection last year, I mean, does anybody even remember Fight For You from Judas and the Black Messiah? We actually have a stacked category this year for Best Original Song. After her snub for Spirit, which she wrote for The Lion King, Beyonce seems like a hot contender this year for her song Be Alive for King Richard. She is currently my number one pick. When it comes to the Bond song No Time To Die, if the film had actually been released last year as scheduled, then it's a very strong possibility that Billie Eilish and her producer slash brother Phineas O'Connell could have won last year. But now that she's lumped in with this year's contenders, I'm not even sure she'll make the cut. Although we've had two Bond songs win from the Daniel Craig era with Skyfall and Writings on the Wall, with No Time to Die, I think it could be nominated, but I don't think it's a guarantee. I also think its chances of winning are very slim just because of how long this song has been out there, sort of floating in the ether. And I'm just gonna say this now for the record, but I think it's an <laughs> actual crime that Vivo, one of the best musicals of the year, with loads of original songs, is probably not gonna get a single 
nomination for best original song. It was one of my favorite movies of the year. It's on Netflix, but nobody watched it and has some of the most emotionally effective original songs of the year. Inside Your Heart, Keep the Beat, and My Own Drum, any one of those would have made a great best original song winner, but nobody is talking about this film, so it just seems super unlikely. Justice for Vivo, let me know if you've seen Vivo in the comment section down below. I could see Alan Black and Daniel Pemberton landing a nomination for Believe, that's the song from the documentary front runner at the moment, The Rescue. Van Morrison could get a nomination for the song Down to Joy from the movie Belfast. Musicals have seen a huge resurgence this year. We had Annette, which was written by the Male Brothers, and Best Song might be the film's only chance for an Oscar nomination. I would think So May We Start has a good chance. It's quite catchy. So may we start. <laughs> um, the only other one I can think of that might get a little bit of traction is we love each other so much. Yeah, I can't sing. <laughs> Sorry, I've been talking to the camera all day. My throat is so dry. My fantasy pick, though, would be Todrick Hall's song that he wrote for the Everybody's Talking About Jamie musical, Work Girl. I love that song. It's an absolute bop, but yeah, I, I just can't see a world where the Academy is going to nominate Todrick Hall for an Oscar, even though he totally would deserve it. Plus it'd be a great song to play at the Oscars just to get everyone feeling their oats. <laughs> La La Land and Great Showman duo, Benj Pasek and Justin Paul have released a new song for the Dear Evan Hansen movie called The Anonymous Ones. But sadly this song just doesn't live up to the Broadway musicals, other well-established, more catchier songs like Waving Through a Window, Requiem, or what was the other one? You Will Be Found. And sadly, none of those songs can qualify because they're not original for the film. As for other musicals, you've got Every Letter from Cyrano, Home All Summer by Le Manuel Miranda for In the Heights, uh, Million to One by Camilla Cabello and Scott Harris, which they did for Cinderella, but yeah, that movie wasn't well received. And also it kind of sounds like a ripoff of A Million Dreams from The Greatest Showman. Just saying. <laughs> then we've got Here I Am Singing My Way Home from the movie Respect, written by Jennifer Hudson, Carol King, and Jamie Alexander Harris. Academy regular Diane Warren. She's been nominated 12 times for Best Original Song and still hasn't won. She was nominated last year for her song Scene in the Life Ahead and somehow still managed to lose to Fight For You from Judas and the Black Messiah. Anyway, she might be nominated this year for her song Somehow You Do from Four Good Days, but sadly the film itself kind of went unnoticed, so I can see her being snubbed for that song. She just can't catch a break, can she? And also we can't forget Disney. They've got a new song called Columbia Mi Encanto from the movie Encanto. Best animated feature. Oh my God, what a year for animation. Like it was so hard to pick a top five for this category and it crushes my soul that I don't have Vivo in my top five, even though I want it to be there. It deserves to be in there, but it's just such a stacked year and you've got heavy hitters from Disney and Pixar this year. I just can't see Vivo getting in. It's not got the word of mouth hype as the Mitchells versus the Machines. I can see that getting in just about. And if it does, that would be my pick to win this year. But Pixar always shows up here. Luca is getting in, in here. Flea keeps picking up more love, momentum, and support. I could see it getting nominated here. Then we've got a few others vying for the last few slots. Ron's Gone Wrong, Raya and the Last Dragon, Belle, Encanto, Charlotte, Whereas and Frank, Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. So yes, it's a very cramped year for animation. Yeah, that's just how good the quality's been this year. It's like some good movies aren't gonna make the cut. Best documentary feature. I haven't actually seen a lot of documentaries this year. I'm hoping to correct that at the London Film Festival, but Flea seems very likely to make it into best documentary, but it also seems poised to show up not only in best animated feature, best documentary feature, but it could also qualify for best international feature and potentially best picture as well. Can you imagine that if it pulled it off? I don't think it will make best picture, but I can see it showing up in animated, documentary, and international feature. And that alone is still a triumphant accomplishment in its own right. I've currently got The Rescue, which is that documentary about the, the rescue of the school children in the underground cave system in Thailand. Yeah, it's got a great reception from all the film festivals it's been to so far. And yeah, that's my number one at the moment. Other documentaries that are in the running are President, Summer of Soul, Julia, Attica, 
Ailey, The Lost Leonardo, The Velvet Underground, The Sparks Brothers, Becoming Costo. But this is a category which I don't feel very confident on just yet because I haven't seen many of the potential candidates. Best International Feature. I've just said before that Flea seems to be set to represent Denmark for Best International Feature, as well as Best Doc and Best Animated Feature. But other films that could show up here, I can see Julia DeCarno's Titan for France. It is a bit of a risky choice, um, but it has got a lot of prestige and a lot of word of mouth buzz behind it. But Norway, probably the worst person in the world. Interestingly though, today I found out that Spain decided to not submit Pedro Almodovar's Parallel Mothers and instead of going with The Good Boss. So yeah, that might show up here. I actually thought they would have had a better chance with Parallel Mothers, but yeah. Uh, the Good Boss from Spain. What else do we have? Memoria could show up for Colombia. Uh, the Hand of God for Paolo Sorrentino. Uh, other possibilities, Drive My Car, Seven Prisoners, A Hero, Happening, Petite Maman, I'm Your Man, Compartment Number Six. Penultimate category is Best Director. Now this is a juicy, stacked category this year. We are absolutely spoiled for choice when it comes to amazing direction. After recently seeing Titan, I would love to see Julia DeCorno get a nom, but that's kind of my wish pick. The level of skill in handling the bonkers themes of this film is masterful. Truly remarkable direction. It is a bit of a long shot, but every now and then a European director does make it into the cut with a non-English speaking film. If Thomas Vinterberg can do it for another round, then there's definitely an argument to be made that Julia DeCorno can do it for Titan. Plus, it would be nice to see her join Jane Campion for The Power of the Dog in Best Director category, proving that last year's two women in the director category wasn't just a fluke. Jane Campion seems very likely to me at the moment. This will be her second nomination for directing. The previous time was back in 1994 for The Piano. Kenneth Branagh almost seems like a certainty now for Belfast, which is miraculous when you consider his previous film before this was Artemis Fowl. <laughs> that movie was so panned, it was god awful. But yeah, talk about a rebound. He's done such a good job of cleaning up his image and reputation after that turd pile of a movie. To go from Artemis Fowl to a potential best picture winner and you know a nomination for directing. Now that's a story. Denis Villeneuve deserves to be in the best director race for simply pulling off the impossible with Dune. I'm not saying he's a lock just yet, but I do think he has a pretty decent chance, even though sci-fi films don't tend to get nominated for best picture or best director, but Denis Villeneuve is kind of the exception to the rule because he was nominated for directing for Arrival, so they clearly respected him for that. I think because of his track record over the past couple decades with the quality of the films that he's made, he's earned himself so much clout and respect within the industry that that will be enough to justify him getting a nomination for Dune. He needs to be in here, he should be in here, but I'm not saying he's a guarantee just yet. There's also a couple of late entries that are waiting in the wings that could show up here, like Guillermo del Toro in Nightmare Alley, Adam McKay for Don't Look Up, Steven Spielberg for West Side Story, Lin-Manuel Miranda for Tick, Tick, Boom, and Aaron Sorkin for Being the Ricardos. Aaron Sorkin is still waiting for his first directorial nomination. He couldn't get it with Trial of Chicago 7. Can he do it with Being the Ricardos? There's also loads of others who are still in contention, like Pablo Lorraine for Spencer, Pedro Almodova, Parallel Mothers, Ronaldo Marcus Green for King Richard, Mike Mills for Come On Come On, Ridley Scott for House of Gucci, Paolo Sorrentino for The Hand of God, Maggie Gyllenhaal for The Lost Daughter, Sean Heater for Coda, Sean Baker for Red Rocket, Joe Wright for Cyrano, and Wes Anderson for The French Dispatch. Honestly, there's too many to choose from. I don't know who it's gonna be. I'm expecting this category to change a lot over the coming months, but those are my top five for now. And last but not least, we have Best Picture. This is the first year where it's now mandatory that there be 10 films nominated for Best Picture, which I'm all for, given just how many amazing films there are every year. Having 10 slots means films that wouldn't typically get a Best Picture nomination will now make the cut. And the way I see it is if you've got 10 slots, use all 10 slots. The only film which I feel confident of saying is a lock for Best Picture is Kenneth Branagh's Belfast. And the only reason for that is because it won the People's Choice Award at the Toronto International Film Festival. And this is a highly reliable indicator of films that will be nominated for Best Picture. In fact, it, not since 2011, 
has a People's Choice Award at TIFF not been at least nominated at the Academy Awards. And also, they've predicted the winner accurately quite a few times. We've had Nomadland, Green Book, 12 Years a Slave, The King's Speech, Slumdog Millionaire. They all won the People's Choice Award at TIFF. So yes, it's a very accurate indicator of a Best Picture nominee. Does that mean I think that Belfast is the current frontrunner for Best Picture? Kind of, but by default, because there are so many more movies yet to be released which could come along and easily overtake it. Nightmare Alley, Licorice Pizza, Being the Ricardos, Don't Look Up, West Side Story, Tick Tick Boom, House of Gucci. Nobody's seen these films yet. Any one of them could break into the Best Picture race and have a late surge of popularity. Having said that, we haven't had a film since 2004's Million Dollar Baby to win Best Picture when it didn't have its debut at a big prestigious film festival like Cannes, TIFF, Venice or Telluride. More often than not, a festival film does end up winning Best Picture. But maybe 2022 is the year that we break the festival trend. The way that I've picked my current 10 is partly instinctual and partly wishful thinking. Do I honestly think Coda will make the cut come March? Possibly not, but I love this film, it was such a crowd pleaser, and I'm simply hoping it does make the cut at this point. I'll assess over the coming months if I do think it will be in the best picture race, but for now, I'm putting it in there. Dune, I feel quite confident, will get a nomination for best picture this year because the Academy, even last year, have received so much flack for picking films for best picture, which only like film critics have seen, not the general public. Having Denis Villeneuve's Dune in the Best Picture race just makes so much sense because it's a film which straddles the line between big screen entertainment and art. It pleases everybody to see Dune in the Best Picture race this year because it's gonna be such a popular film and it deserves it. Not just because it's popular, but because it's earned it. It really is one of the top 10 best films of the year. It should be in this category. The Academy would be dummies for not having it as part of the 10 nominees for Best Picture this year. Other films which I think have a decent chance of a Best Picture nomination are Spencer, The Power of the Dog, King Richard, The Lost Daughter, Come On, Come On, Mass. And then there's a few others which are in the discussion but don't seem as likely but could show up like Red Rocket, Parallel Mothers, Cyrano, The Eyes of Tammy Faye, A Hero, The French Dispatch. But yeah, it's all speculation and theory at the moment. What are your 10 picks for Best Picture currently? And also, if you have any other thoughts on any of the Oscar categories or predictions, let your voice be heard in that comment section down below. Please do help support the channel by hitting the thumbs up button, by sharing this video, and also subscribing. And if you want to stay up to date with all my award season coverage, be sure to follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, all those links in that video description down below. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. For more things related to movies, TV, the Oscars, and popcorn culture, I'm Lee Carefield, and I'll see you next time.